Uh, so I've travelled halfway across the world to finally see uh, my academic passion, which is for the last five years, uh, which is research and faculty tapping. Uh, we're in Urfa at the moment, uh, ancient city of Edessa during the Roman period and during Christianity period. So I'll use my notes a little bit here as well because it's difficult to remember everything in the chronology that I want to present it. The first person to go to Gebekli Tepe, first academic, was a, a man by the name of Peter Benedict in 1963. <laughs> and in 1963, of course, Peter Benedict came here and he likened this site to a Byzantine cemetery. Of course, that's completely understandable with the knowledge that they had at the time in 1963 that it could be just simply a Byzantine cemetery. So the farmer who found this found the stones sticking out of his farm, of course, and this would have occurred somewhere in the you know, 1950s, 60s as well. He went to the antiquities department uh, in Urfa and he explained that he found something pretty important because there are lots of stone tools that he discovered on his farm, etc. And the Urfa antiquities department actually turned him away and said this is nothing, um, which is a, a great shame. But uh, not, to not to worry though because uh, the Turkish farmer continued to find these stone tools and he put them around his fence on the outside of his farm. And eventually these stone tools beckoned him to continually pester the local uh, antiquities department to say, listen, bring someone out here, let's have a look at this place. So eventually, uh, that happened in the 1995-94, uh, Klaus Schmidt uh, was working on a site nearby and that site uh, unfortunately fell under construction or for a dam or something like that. And so Klaus Schmidt had to find a new passion and a new uh, focus so for his work. So Klaus Schmidt came out here, lo and behold, and started uh, excavations, of course. And here you can see some of the excavations that are, they've obviously uh, continued throughout that process up until now. The interesting thing about Gebekli Tepe is that through radar penetration, they've found another 50 to 60 of these circles, okay, in the outlaying fields. So this that would therefore make this one of the, if not, the largest megalithic site in the world. Now we're going to talk about the timeline. The timeline is very interesting because we're looking at something that is 9,600 years old. Now, that date is very important because in 9,800, uh, the Younger Dryas Ice Age finished. Now, the Younger Dryas Ice Age was caused by a comet impact. The comet impact was probably around about 10,500. I'll have to check, uh, check my dates and I'll add some annotations in the documentary later. Now, when those the glacial ice melts of the Younger Dryas uh, Ice Age finished, um, obviously all the people in North uh, Europe and places like that had to migrate somewhere else. Andrew Collins has an interesting theory about this. Now, Andrew Collins is just an author and so are the Graham Hancocks, but we're not going to dismiss everything they do simply because they're not of the academic circles. Uh, they've done great work in popularising Gebekli Tepe and bringing it to the forefront. And all of this new construction you can see here that the local authorities have spent money on would not have happened without authors like these continuing their good work uh, to expose this site and what it means. Now, Back to the climate refugees that probably were the people that came here. Andrew Collins believes that this may have been an older culture called the Salutrians. The Salutrians existed in Northern Europe and they may have come here to find a new place, uh, obviously to escape the changing climate. So over here, you might be able to see on this pillar, um, which you will see what looks like a crane. And the crane is holding something, it's a circle. Speculation could suggest that this circle may have been the comet or the comets that the people at the time kept seeing in the sky. You'll also see a crane on the side of that pillar as well. The cranes are very important uh, because you also see these in Haran as well. Haran and Gebekli Tepe could be connected religiously in that sense. So the comets kept appearing in the sky and the shamans that came from the Salutrians came here and said, okay, listen guys, if you want us to stop these things from happening, then you need to listen to us, okay? And we need to start building these temples. So our shaman can, uh, through altered states of consciousness, uh, speak to the people in the, I guess, uh, cosmic world and stop these comets from hitting the place. So in one of the pillars, you'll see a circle and that circle lines up with the star constellation Cygnus. And Cygnus is very important uh, and could be represented here in the image of the crane. You'll also see an ibis, which is a black 
uh, bald-headed ibis, which is also featured there on this pillar as well. Now, the interesting thing about these stones at Gebekli Tepe is that they're anthropomorphic. And what does that mean? Anthropomorphism is the idea that we're presenting something that looks human, but it's not. You can see the T-shaped stones at the top of the pillars, and uh, yet you can see hands wrapping around the front, and you can also see a belt buckle and a garment going down. Now, this belt buckle and garment that you see in the front of the pillars with the hands, the long fingers covering the front, is very interesting because this demonstrates that we're looking at very high culture to 9,600 BC. We're talking about garments, we're talking about belts, and obviously we haven't even discussed the workmanship involved here and what was required. Okay? Gebekli Tepe obviously was built by hunter-gatherers. Now, what were hunter-gatherers doing at that particular time? Well, they were hunting, food and gathering. They did have a lot of time, however, but did they have stone tools to carve and move these pillars, some of which weighed between 10 to 15 tonnes, which is about twice the weight of the minibus that took us up here? Now, that is very interesting, that they even managed to carve this bedrock and then shift it. They've found the quarry nearby. That's no secret to where the quarrying came from. It's rather close, OK? And once you can actually lift cut, lift and begin moving these stones, you can move them a long distance if you can get them to stand up. Now, if you look at this pillar here, you can see that this is a freestanding stone. Okay, it is perfectly cut, it is sitting on the bedrock and it is a freestanding stone. Now, you'll also notice that the pillars are very thin on this particular one. That involves extremely intricate stone cutting. Okay, we're going to move over there now and have a look at that. <coughs> So the pillars are very, very thin, and some of these pillars you'll see anthropomorphic and animal figures coming out of the sides, which means that the rock would have had to be cut away in. Now that is a stone cutting technique that is extremely difficult, extremely time consuming, and of course that means that the original slice of the bedrock had to be much thicker. Moving along you can see images of animals as well. So what this suggests is that the people who came here, was it the Salutrians, the climate refugees after the Younger Dryas Ice Age? Some different theories present themselves here, but the matter of fact is that this thing is here, it happened, it was built by hunter-gatherers. There's no question about that. So we need to change our timeline drastically of linear technological progression if we're to start to begin the conversation honestly about what Gebekli Tepe is, because we don't see anything like this uh, for another four to 5,000 years, presenting itself in Sumer. Now, back to the workforce that would have been required to do this. Well, you would have had to have a hierarchy. You would have had to have someone in control, someone who's calling the shots, okay? Something that we didn't think hunter-gatherers had. So they've got a hierarchy, they've got a workforce, and you've got to have organisation, okay? One theory is suggested, they did find a big trough nearby, and that trough was thought to be something that they brewed beer in. Okay, now if you're brewing beer, you're halfway on the track to uh, agriculture. Okay, so again, this predates agriculture, this site, by a lot. And what they think happened was is that they, all the people from the surrounding area would come here for a celebration and they'd drink beer, they'd have a big party, and their workforce would stay for a couple of days later. Okay, and then the shamans would perform their duties to the star sign Cygnus, Okay, communicate with these cosmic forces to tell them to stop the comet impact. Now, the interesting thing about Gebekli Tepe is that there's a lot of older circles underneath these ones, and what they would do is they'd build the newer circles and then cover up the older circles. Okay? Some of the later circles, though, shows a digression of technology. The circles that we see that were cut after the original circles are much smaller, and some of the stones only stand about four foot high. In other words, once the comets finally stopped happening and the Earth's geological shifts stopped happening, the necessity for the shamans to have this temple was reduced. They no longer had to have these ceremonies to stop the comet uh, impact. Um, and in 8,000, the site was completely covered up, okay? Which is interesting. Why would you cover up the site? Is it so later people cannot find it? Or is it to protect something that needs to be, uh, that is much more important? to the star systems and the zodiacs? We don't know. But um, what we're talking about here is that the circles got smaller and smaller, and eventually the people left in 8,000 BC. So this site was only used for 1,500 years. We've actually got a, pr we're pretty lucky today. There's not a lot of people here at all. 
probably because it's 45 degrees or something ridiculous like that. I do not recommend that people come here in August, but in that sense, it's still a dry heat, so it's tolerable. So I'm going to look at the notes again to see if I've missed anything. Um, I just want to make sure that I've done it justice because I really want to make sure we've covered everything properly. The problem with this site is hunter-gatherers are building megalithic stones. And I think that we need to look at these, um, what do they call, suedo scientists they've been called, but they're, they're, they're branded off in academia very quickly without people looking into what they're actually researching and saying. Andrew Collins and Graham Hancock's work, Fingerprint of the Gods, is an interesting read. He's just an author. Um, is he the right person to be uh, presenting this, this new idea to the whole world and popularising it? I think so, because a lot more people are coming here and they're starting to look into these questions. Okay. What is interesting here is that we might be looking at people, possibly, that had knowledge from a previous advanced pre-Ice Age civilization. We don't find any other places around here anything like this. Navali Chori is the nearest site. And that Navali Chori is very similar in a sense. It has a square base. You see big pillars like this, not as tall as these ones, but Navali Chori also shows many of the animals' carvings on it as well. Other than that, we don't have any other examples of anything like this in the nearby area, and we don't have anything else like that excavation-wise for another 4,000 years. That is the big question mark. So we need to change our timeline of accepted history narratives. We need to change the textbooks. We need to start to get this information out there. And a lot of, um, a lot of these uh, mounds you see around this place contain more, more circles like this, which is interesting. The, the type of rock that it's uh, created from is limestone. Limestone is very easy to carve into. And we possibly see examples of these people using concrete as well which is another form of technology. So there it is, really. It stands over here. Sorry, you can see the circle. This is the circle that was pointing at the star constellation Cygnus. So there's lots of theories as to what this could be, who these people were, why did they build it. This is definitely a temple. This is not a place to live. You can see that from looking at this. It's just fascinating. Things just keep, keep, keep on getting older and older and older and older. And we're going to have to start to change the story and change the narrative soon. Sizinle tanışmak gerçekten çok büyük bir onur bizim için. Kısaca anlatabilir misiniz nasıl ortaya çıktı, neler yaşadınız? Tamam. Peki nasıl e, buldunuz burayı? Hani buraya ne için gelmiştiniz? Buraya önce bura tarım Yani burası hep kutsal olarak bilinen bir alandı. Tabii kazıyı tam bugün 
şesine geldi. O kazi burayı ilk yapan Harald Hopetman. Bugün bence o da Almanya'da mı ölmüş düşündüğüm şeylerden. Hmm. Klaus Schmidt'ten değil, Patronu ondan de, önceki. Patronu Klaus Schmidt onun yanında öğrenci olarak çalışıyor. Hmm. Bu da dört beş sene çalıştı o andan sonra. Burayı Klaus Schmidt'e devredi. Hmm. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate that. Erfa, now our taxi driver Mustafa for the day is insisting that we uh, go to a local farmer's house, a friend of his, and uh, drink some tea, which uh, we will oblige. So these are the beehive houses and uh, they're made of mud brick and uh, the people in Haran live in these, the temperature is definitely half of what it is outside immediately and that's because uh, of this shaped roof so the air pretty much lifts above head height immediately and escapes through a hole at the top there which you can see. And that's how they kept themselves cool in this ridiculously hot climate. This is incredible. Lots of people come here. It's a very popular tourist spot. And of course, they're going to have some pretty good gozleme and other things. So this is uh, a tool that they use to make iron, which is a uh, drink made from yogurt and water. So uh, how they did it was they put the ingredients in there and they shake it really fast. So by keep doing it, the ayran becomes a little bit more bubbly, bubbly and then, yeah, it's, it becomes really tasty. So that's how they did They tie the thing up there on the roof and they shake it. Okay, here we are. This is the castle of Edessa. This place formerly known as Edessa. Uh, very important uh, place throughout history, in biblical history. Uh, in Islam. Edessa, conquered by the Romans in 200 AD, thereabouts. I'll have to check my dates and I'll fix that in the comment section. Uh, there is obviously a lot of information about Edessa during the Crusades from 1098 to 1150. Uh, Edessa was a cultural melting pot, very important place for Syriac Christians as well. So another part of the world where people live side by side happily interacted daily. Um, there's even a story about the uh, king and the Assyrian king uh, prior to Roman rule and eventually after that Seljuk rule and Ottoman rule, Byzantine in between. Uh, the king wrote to Jesus Christ asking for help and healing and uh, I'll provide some links about more about that um, in, the, uh, in the notes. But here it is in all its glory, at sundown. You can only imagine what things you'd see here if you were in the streets a thousand years ago. This is also featured in Assassin's Creed 1, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, that, that game is set in uh, Edessa. And uh, yeah, I'd recommend people come here and see this for themselves. Earth has become a very safe place to visit. It's, it's not in any way dangerous. Yes, obviously things were a bit more difficult during the war with Syria. That war has ended arguably and uh, we just went to Haran which is 10 kilometers from the uh, Syrian border. Absolutely no problems at all. Um, the hospitality of the people here in this city is unbelievable. Uh, we've had a man with us all day, a taxi driver who's taken us around. Uh, he's taken us to meet his friends, his family, uh, spending time with some, a farmer for example when we were at Quebecli Tepe and uh, he's given us a real experience. You know, if you really want to see the world uh, through, not if, with, on a tour and you want to see the world uh, in an interesting way, well, we've done it with taxi drivers. <laughs> Just pay them for the whole day, they stay with you, you get to know them, they befriend you, and they do their absolute best to make sure that you've had a great time. Well, this will be the final video of our trip. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've, uh, we had fun doing it. 
and uh, I'd 100% recommend that people start coming out, out here and uh, supporting the tourism here. Uh, you'll have a fantastic stay no matter what.